Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to continue in our series, Walking with Christ, and we're a few weeks into the series. We're also a few verses into uh, this chapter, so at this rate, I think we'll be done with Ephesians in like two or three years, maybe, if we just keep doing this one verse at a time. Um, in, all serious, in all seriousness, though, I'm, I'm thankful that we take the word seriously and that we will go through this slowly and we'll learn from it and we'll let God speak for himself. Um, as you know, we are in this series called Walking with Christ, and this is the second half of Ephesians. The first half of Ephesians, if you remember, the end of last year, beginning of this year, was a series called Union with Christ, and it was chapters one through three of the book of Ephesians, and now we're in chapters four through six of the book of Ephesians. And if you remember, Union with Christ, we talked mainly about who God is and who we are in Christ. There's a lot of in Christ, that phrase in Christ is used a ton of times in Ephesians chapter one through three. And then chapters four through six is kind of like the playing out of that, the implications of that. What does that mean for Christian believers? What should their walk look like? Some people call it, you know, um, chapters one through three is theology and four through six is like methodology. Like how do we, how do we live? Chapters one through three is like the root, like who, who is God? And then the chapters four through six is the fruit of our lives, the fruit of the Spirit working itself out in our lives. And if you remember chapter one, Paul opens up, he's talking to the Ephesians, and he opens up, and he opens up with this huge like praise song. Chapter one is just like an incredible, like almost like a praise song of like, blessed be the God and Father. He adopted us, he redeemed us, he predestined us, he chose us, it was through, we were uh, we are forgiven of our sins through Christ, through his blood. Chapter two is when he talks a lot about our former life and our current life, right? One of the most famous passages in chapter two is you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the, the course of this world, following the prince of the, the power of the air, but God was rich in mercy and he took what was dead and he made it alive in Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then chapter three, Paul talks about I'm in prison, but it's okay because like it's a good thing because the gospel is reaching out. And then we get to chapter four and there's this, this word we looked at a few weeks ago, therefore. And as any good Bible reader, whenever you see the word therefore, you should ask what is therefore? Okay, let's try it. What is therefore? There you go. And so you see this word therefore and you see this hinge, this like this, this, this turn in the book of Ephesians where Paul is now saying, all right, we have this idea now, we, we believe who we are in God, we know who God is, so now let's look at how this looks, what this looks like in our lives. And so I wanna read chapters, uh, chapter four, verses one, and I'm actually gonna read through verse 16 um, to give like a whole context of, of what we're, we're doing here. So follow along with me in Ephesians chapter four, we'll start in verse number one. <clears throat> Therefore, I, a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and, and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all, through all, and in all. But grace was given to each of one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And of course, in saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, Others as prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until we, we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we wouldn't be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes, but rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We know that the Lord is our, and the Spirit are the, the best teachers and interpreters of the Scripture, so let's go to Him in prayer right now. Father, we love you, and we are so thankful for your word. We are thankful for this little letter to the Ephesians. Um, and, I, and I ask right now, Holy Spirit, that you would teach us, you would convict us, you would mold our hearts, you would shape our minds, you would open our eyes. And as the preachers of old used to pray, I ask that you would stand in my body, think in my mind, and speak through my mouth today. Lord, may the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. My dad was uh, born in the 60s, so he was a child of the 60s and 70s, and so naturally he loved rock and roll music. And one of his favorite bands was Journey. And when I, we have one Journey fan here. <laughs> When I was, two journey fans, when I was, that, that's okay. When I was uh, a kid, I would go, when I would, when I would be in my dad's car, he had this CD and it was Journey's Greatest Hits. And he would always say, I was like a little 10 year old, and he would, we would always listen to that thing on repeat, on repeat, on repeat. And he'd always be like, hey, don't tell your mom like you're listening to, to Journey. So, sorry, mom. Um, but what we would do is, is I would listen to those eight tracks, those eight songs over and over again. And eventually later in life, people would be like, oh, do you like Journey? I'd be like, yeah, I love Journey. Like, I know Journey. Of course I do. And then people would ask me, like, oh, like, what's your favorite song? And I'd say, like, don't stop believing. Like, all of the classic greatest hits of Journey songs. And then I would think about it, and I'd be like, well, actually, I don't really know, like, Journey. Like, all of their songs, all of their albums. I just know those eight songs, those eight greatest hits, right? And some of you guys are laughing because you guys have experienced that before. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. And you're like, well, actually, no, I, I don't know that. Those are kind of the greatest hits. And I think sometimes what we do, we're going to see this play out twice here in, in the letter of the Ephesians. We do this when it comes to reading the Bible. We find these Christian greatest hits phrases, or some of you guys call them Christianese, or Christian buzzwords, or whatever. And we just kind of like skim through, and we're like, boom, 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 greatest hits. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, I'm good. I got that. And then you think about it, and you're like, well, maybe I, I, I don't know that. And Ephesians is like the greatest hits of all greatest hits. I mean, in this passage, we're looking at, you know, body, spirit, Lord, faith, baptism. Earlier, we saw redemption, forgiveness, predestination, chosen, adoption. Like, uh, the greatest, it's like Paul spared no punches. He's just like, here is everything that you need to know and all the greatest hits about Christianity. So, what I want to do is in these, these two verse, three verses we're going to look at, we're going to look closely at verse 4, verse 5, and verse 6. And there's two things I want to I use this illustration for. The first is it can be very easy to let our eyes glaze over and be like, yep, I know what he's saying. I've heard that word before. I know what he means. And so I want to challenge us to not do that. And then the second thing is, is this passage is, is like the greatest hit. It's going to feel like we're taking a victory lap here. Like this is just all of the best things about Christianity that we're gonna be talking about today. So it is just, an and I pray that this passage is encouraging and it's, it, uh, it's um, illuminating and it lifts our eyes up to who God is and therefore who we are in God. Does that make sense? Cool. So let's look at verse four. Verse four starts <clears throat> with, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to one hope of your calling. If you notice, these few verses, they feel a little bit different. Verses uh, four, five, and six, they feel a little bit different than most, Paul's, most of Paul's like, letters. Like, oftentimes, Paul like, has these super long sentences, and they're too long, and they just keep going, and you're like, slow down, Paul. Like, I, I need to catch up, right? Th these three verses, one body, one spirit, one, it, it's kind of like, a, like an abrupt interruption. And if you look again at verse four, the first two words there are what? There is. And actually in the Greek, th those two words aren't there. We supplied them, but those two words aren't there. So it just starts one body. It's a very abrupt kind of interruption. So if you look at the screen right here, verse three, picking up at the end of verse three, it would read like this. We are to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, one body, one spirit. And then he goes on. 
So in diagram form, it kind of looks like this. Verses one through three are like a train of thought, and then there's just this like plopped right in here, verses four, five, and six. And a lot of people think, and I think correctly so, there were um, these things called creeds, that the, not a band, but creeds this, uh, that the early church would use, and they were just like short little sentences that early Christians would memorize to, because you, know, you go on a church's website or you go somewhere and you see like articles of faith, if you have ever read those, <laughs> good for you, but you see those articles of faith and it's like pages and pages of what we believe and who we are. Well, in the early church, they didn't have that, they didn't even have all of the New Testament, so what they would do is they would memorize just a few sentences as a creed to say, this is what we believe, this is who we are. You might think of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. This is a very common thing. And so what Paul did here is in verse one through three, he's like, you know, I therefore, he's continuing his argument, very logical. I urge you, walk with meekness, walk with patience, be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, one body. And he inserts this creed. And then he picks up in verse seven and he continues on, continues on excuse me, through verse 16. And so the question then is why would he do this, right? Why? Why did he just add this there? What's going on? And the answer is because he wants to remind us why we strive for unity. The reason that that we should be uh, walking worthy of the calling to which we have been called, the reason we should be walking with meekness, the reason we should have patience towards one another, the reason that we should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace is because one body. In other words, Paul is saying you need to become who you already are. You already are these things, so you need to become these things. And and that's the phrase that we could look at through through the whole thing. In in essence, on this slide, this is the, the paradigm for what this passage is saying. He is saying live with Blank, because you already have blank. Live with unity, live with one body, live with one spirit, live with one hope, live with one Lord, live with one faith, one baptism, one God. Why? Not because you have to strive to get that, but because you already have it. So this is a a summary, if you will, of of chapters one through three. And so what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna go through each of these one, there's seven one phrases, which I think is really cool. Seven, come on, that's not an accident. Uh, there's these seven one phrases. And before we do, uh, we don't have time to do this now, but I did this in my <clears throat> study for this. It would be really helpful, I think, if you took, throughout the week, take one of those statements, like one body, and then go through the letter of Ephesians and read it. You know, it takes 20, 30 minutes to read the whole letter. And underline, highlight, circle where Paul uses the word body. And look at the context. Look at what he means. Does he mean the body of Christ? Does he mean Christ's body? Does he mean a physical body? And then do the same thing with spirit and look through and do it there. It's very, very enlightening and and very cool. So I would really encourage you guys to do that. But let's go. One body. The body uh, imagery and metaphor is probably, in fact it is, Paul's favorite uh, picture or illustration of who Christians are. In chapter one, verse 22 and 23, he said, and he put all things under his feet, under uh, God put all things under Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body the gathering of believers, the people of God is the body of Christ. You might think of Romans 12, where Paul says, for as in one body we have many members, and the members, they don't all have the same function, people do different things, members of the body do different things, so we, church, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. You might think of 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about there's many members, there's many functions, and they don't all have the same function. And that's when he talks about, you know, the foot can't say, you know what, I don't really need you anymore, so I'm just gonna be gone, right? If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? We cannot be divided, Paul is saying, 
when we are one body. The purpose of this is because there can be no division among the people of God. Because why? We are one body. Yes, there all are multiple parts of the body. There are different functions. But because we're called to live with humility towards one another, because we're called to live at peace with one another and towards one another, because we're called to live patiently with one another and putting the needs of others above the needs of ourselves, because of that, that is how we become one body. Paul is saying live as one body. Why? Because you already are one body. Become who, who you are. Next is one spirit. We just came out of a sermon series on the spirit where we learned that the spirit is primarily two things. It is the presence and it is the power of God. The spirit is the life-giving presence of God. It is God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is also the power of God. The Spirit does not make bad people good. The Spirit does not make kind of broken relationships a little less broken. The Spirit makes dead people alive and broken relationships whole. And we have one Spirit. God cannot be divided. This is what Paul is saying. God cannot be divided because we have one spirit, so how can we be divided amongst each other? Live with one spirit. This is what Paul is saying. Live in the unity of one spirit. Why? Because we already have one spirit. Walk worthy of the manner to which you have been called. Live with meekness, with patience, with putting the needs of others above the needs of yourself. Live with one spirit. Why? Because we have one spirit. Next is one hope. Just as you were called, look at verse four again. There's one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. This exact phrase is used in chapter one, verse 18. And I think hope is a little uh, tricky because we might think of it as like a, like a blind optimism, right? Like, um, oh, I just really, really hope this happens. Kind of crossing my fingers, so to speak. And biblical hope is not that at all. In fact, biblical hope, the, the exact same word in, in the scriptures is translated two ways in English. It's one word in the originals. It's two ways. We use the words hope and the word wait. You might think of the Psalms, I will wait on the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Same word. Hope for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, hope for the Lord. In Isaiah, it's used, that word is used when you plant, when a farmer plants seeds and they, what? They wait for the fruit. They hope for the fruit. Why? Because earlier, maybe the year before, they planted seeds and fruit came from the tree. So because of that, they know what's going to happen when they plant seeds in the ground because they're going to hope and they're going to wait for what has happened formerly to happen again. See where I'm going with this? Our hope, biblical hope, is based on the faithfulness of God that we have seen. And so we hope for, we wait in, we believe in that God will be faithful again because he was faithful then. Biblical hope is saying God has redeemed his people over and over and over and over again. He took me when I was dead in my trespasses and sins and he made me alive. So now I'm going to hope and I'm called to this hope that Christ will again one day come down and he will judge the living and the dead. That is biblical hope. We have one hope. So live with one hope. We can't hope in anything else because everything else is not faithful. Nothing else is faithful. Everything we try to hope in and hope for is based on something that was unfaithful beforehand. That is why we hope in Christ and in Christ alone. That is the hope that we are called to. One body, one spirit, one hope 
that belongs to your call. We're not called to, op- to blind optimism. We're not called to fear. We're not called to anger, to anxiety, to disunity. We are called to wait for, to hope in the Lord. Live with one hope, Paul is saying, because you have one hope. Next is one Lord. The Lord, the man, Jesus Christ. Lord is Paul's favorite title for Jesus. And this Jesus, as we learned in Ephesians 1 through 3, is what? He's risen from the dead. Not only is he risen from the dead, but he has ascended on high at the right hand of God the Father. He's not only above the physical world, he is above the other spiritual world, which is where we used to walk. We used to walk in the prince of the power of the air. But now Christ is seated on high. He is raised. This is the Lord. And that Lord himself says we can't serve two lords. For you will hate one and love the other. We cannot serve one Lord, as Paul says, and also serve the Lord of family. We cannot serve one Lord and also serve the Lord of our kids. We cannot serve one Lord and also serve the Lord of sports or the Lord of school or the Lord of money or the, world, the Lord of work or of power or of knowledge. We have one Lord. We cannot serve two Lords, two masters. Paul is saying, live as if you have one Lord. Why? Because you only have one Lord. One Lord, one faith. Faith is, um, as you know from Hebrews, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I like another word, the idea of clinging to something. We we hear this a lot, and in fact, in chapter one, Paul says, I have heard of your faith. I've heard of it. Well, a lot of times I I, I think that faith is like this internal, like, disposition to a certain set of beliefs and knowledge that once I have it, then therefore I have faith, right? But you, nobody can hear about that. If, it's ju- if, if faith is just my personal like um, conviction and it doesn't play out in my life, you can't hear about that. Think about this. You, you've heard before like, oh man, that person, you, you've seen somebody walking with the Lord for 30, 40, 50, 60 years and you say, what? Wow, that person has a strong faith. That person is walking with the Lord. I, I, I hear of their faith, and what do we mean by that? We mean that despite all of the life circumstances that have happened, whether it's loss, whether it's pain, whether it's whatever it is, we see that person, we hear that that person is continually walking with the Lord, which means what? They are continually clinging to something beyond themselves, bigger than themselves. Paul says that he continually clings to the cross. I've decided to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. Now that doesn't make any sense at all. The all-powerful creating God decided that it would be best for him to come down as a human and die on a splintery piece of wood. This is not a logic of this world This is not a logic of this kingdom, which means what? It is therefore a logic of a different world and a different kingdom. This is the faith that we have. It's the kingdom of God where the weak are made strong, the poor are made rich, the last will be first, the first will be last, and ultimately the dead will be raised to new life forever. This is our faith. This is what we cling to. This is the only thing, as we talked about with hope, this is the only thing that we ought to be loving, serving, giving our lives to and for. Like I said earlier, we can't have a faith in one thing and also a kind of sub-faith over here. We can't have a faith in this kingdom of heaven and in God and also be serving and loving this thing over here and clinging to this thing over here. To cling to something means that it's, your, both of your arms are wrapped around it. You can't wrap both of your arms around something and also one thing over here. Paul is saying live with one faith. Why? Because you already have one faith. One Lord, one faith 
one baptism. One baptism, one means of incorporation into the family of Christ. Baptism has two purposes here in the, uh, in the scriptures. The first is uh, to identify as a new person. We use the words, this is a public proclamation of who I am. Baptism is us identifying as a new person. I used to be dead. I wasn't just bad and now I'm good. I wasn't just a little bit worse and now I'm a little bit better. I was dead and I am a new person. The first purpose of baptism is to identify as a new person with a new family as well. The second reason, or the second purpose of baptism is because it is participation with Christ. One, Christ was baptized, and so we also are to be baptized. But, but think about what we say a lot of times in some traditions. They say, buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. You see, Jesus in his life he took what people call a downward mobility. He was in the form of God, didn't consider it a thing to be grasped, made himself nothing, passed through a lot. He passed through the waters of baptism. He passed through temptation of the enemy, both in the wilderness and in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then ultimately, he passed through death and was raised and ascended on the other side. When we say, when we become baptized, when we have this one baptism, we are saying, I am participating in that. I am participating in being buried with Christ and being raised with him. I am participating in, to put it another way, crucifying my flesh with its sinful desires and being raised into newness of life. That is one baptism. That is one allegiance that we give. That is one identity we have. We don't identify as anything else. We don't identify with a certain family or school or city or state or country or political party or sexual orientation or gender or an American or a conservative or a liberal. We identify and we pledge allegiance to one thing and that is expressed in baptism and that is Christ and him crucified. Paul is saying live with one baptism, live as if you have been baptized into one thing. Why? Because you have already been baptized into one thing. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. He's over all things, he's through all things, he's in all things. Notice Paul starts with body, the thing right in front of us, to spirit, to Lord, to faith, to baptism, to what? God and Father of all. For thousands of years, the Jewish people would recite what is known as the Shema. Try saying that, Shema. Okay, never mind, don't try to say that. Uh, Shema, and it's on, it's on the screen here, and, and what it is is it was just a prayer. It's found in Deuteronomy 6, verses four and five, and for thousands of years, every morning, every midday, and every evening, the Jewish people would recite this, and it would say, they would say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it goes on in verse five and six to say, And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. Jesus says this is one of the greatest commandments. Paul was a Jew. He was the Jew of all Jews. He was a Pharisee of all Pharisees. And he would have known this frontwards, forwards, backwards. All, like He would have probably had almost the whole book of Deuteronomy memorized. This is what distinguished Israel from other uh, religions, from other countries, is that they had one God. And they would say, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. God our God, God is one. And look at what Paul is doing here. Paul is saying, yes, we have one God. And we have one Lord. And we have one spirit. Verse four is the spirit. Verse five is the Lord, Jesus. Verse six is God the Father. In other words, Paul is basing his plea for us to maintain unity in the unity of the Father. 
In other words, as we just sang, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, we call this the Trinity. In other words, because of the Trinity, you should be unified because you're in him. In other words, because God is so selflessly loving of himself and there is perfect harmony, there is a perfect relationship, and there is a constant selflessly giving, fully giving of the self for the other, what should we, who claim to be in Christ and in him, also be doing? We should also be unified. We should also be, be, be seeking to maintain unity. We should also be putting the needs of others above the needs of ourselves. How can we not? How can we not? It's a contradiction to not do that. It's a contradiction to say, I am in God, I am God's family, and be angry with your brothers and sisters who are in the same family. It's a contradiction to serve a God who is completely selfless with himself and then yet always and constantly put the needs of ourself above the needs of others. It is a contradiction to, to cause dissension and disunity with our tongues when we gossip and we slander and we pick on other people. Paul is saying you cannot do that because you are in God. If you and others are off, it's probably a sign that you and God are off. Our walking with Christ has its foundation and its power from the fact that we are in him. To say it again, we can only walk with Christ when we are walking with Christ's body. <clears throat> in, uh, in 1979, there was a, a, coach, a hockey coach by the name of Herb Brooks, and uh, he was chosen to be the coach for the 1980s U.S. Olympic hockey team. And uh, there's a movie made about this called Miracle, Miracle on Ice. And um, basically what he did is a lot of coaches in the past, Russia was the, like, the team to beat at the time. And a lot of coaches in the past, they would go straight to the NHL, which is the major leagues, right? But Coach Herb, what he did is, is he decided to go to colleges. So he went to all these different universities uh, where the best hockey players from the best hockey schools would be competing. And he, he made this team of a bunch of misfit college kids. And uh, if you've seen the movie, um, throughout, throughout his practices, throughout the, the, the exhibition games, all of, these, all of these college kids, they still have their school pride, and they can't let it go. And, and they still are like, well, this is my school, and he plays for that school. I mean, they know each other, right? They know each other by name. They know each other's school, and, and they do not like each other. And so they're hanging on to their school pride because they can't be on the same team as somebody else who is actually on their same team. And so throughout the, uh, the course of this, Coach Herb would, uh, he would always ask, you know, different players throughout, what's your name, where you're from, and who do you play for? And so they would, you know, say, I I'm so-and-so, I play for so-and-so, and I'm from the University of Michigan, or I'm from the University of Boston, or I'm from the University of Minnesota, right? And uh, eventually they go on and, and they play an exhibition game against Norway, where they're supposed to, Norway was just, bad, and they were just supposed to beat them. They were supposed to wipe them out. And they tied three to three. And Coach Herb made them stay on the ice after, and he made them do suicides, which was actually, they actually called them Herbies because, uh, after their coach, because he made them do it so much. And basically what happened is he put them on the goal line at the end of the game, and he made them skate to the first blue line and back, middle red line back, the next blue line back, and then all the way to the end and back. If you've played any sports, you know that suicides are called that for a reason. And, um, and what he did is he kept doing that again and again and again and again. And this part's true. There was actually the custodian in the stadium had to turn off the lights because everybody was gone. He was making them do it for hours. They were exhausted. They were wiped out. They were throwing up. They were doing, like, it, it was just miserable. And eventually the captain, he speaks up and he says, my name is Mike Ruzioni. And Coach Herb says, who do you play for? And he says, I play for the United States of America. 
And in that moment, there was a shift. And Coach Herb knew something. He knew they were already one team. They just weren't playing like one team. And in that moment, there was a shift, and they went on to beat Norway 9-0 to the next day. They went on to beat all of these, these powerhouse hockey teams, and eventually they won. The, they were the youngest team ever to win the gold medal of the 1980 U.S. Olympics because in that moment, they realized that they were playing they were playing on different teams, but they were on the same team. They were disunified because they had all of these, these, these preferences and this school pride and all of these things, and you see where I'm going with this. This is some hockey team that found unity. How much more unified are we in the son of the living God? Paul is saying, you already have it. So crucify your sin differences, crucify your sin preferences, and live in it. And I don't know how the Spirit is applying this to your guys' lives right now. Because <clears throat> um, this is easy in theory, and it's easy to talk about, but it's much harder in practice. And so the, the Spirit might have brought a name to your mind, a situation to your heart, a conversation that you might need to have. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but we need to have the humility to say, Spirit, teach me to be unified. So the reflection question, if you will, is how are you maintaining unity? How are you maintaining unity? What do you need to do to maintain that unity? Because you already have it. It's not like you need to do anything to get it. It doesn't say be eager to create the unity of the Spirit. It says be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. How are you maintaining unity? How is the Spirit in your life urging you, nodding you, prodding you to say there is disunity here? between you and this person, between this situation and theirs. Maybe it's you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's you need to, to, to call somebody. I don't know how that is, but I do know that Paul is saying, you already have unity, so live in unity.